When the game loads up for the first time and you're immediately greeted by the Giat, that's how you know you're in for a good time. Welcome. So I'm trying out a new series that I like to call the Atrocious Gacha Review, where I will play a gacha game as a low spender for one month straight and give an honest review of my own experience in regards to the gameplay, design, monetization, and progression to let you have an informed decision whether it's worth trying out or not. The first entry on this series is a game with culture. It's called Snowbreak Containment Zone. Imagine a live service 3D looter shooter like Destiny or Warframe, but with gacha waifus instead. You may have heard of this one now that it's even available on Steam, and with me sinking an abnormally good amount of hours into it, let's find out is Snowbreak worth your time? So what's Snowbreak about? Well, I'm gonna be honest here, I wasn't really paying attention to the story. Uh, but the basic overview is that during a time where humanity was having incredible technological breakthroughs, a mysterious titan crashed into the city and released a snow-like pollutant that warranted the city to be abandoned, with the zone promptly being labeled Containment Zone Aleph. You play as the adjutant, a military officer that leads your harem of operatives that have awakened mythical powers to explore the containment zone and uncover its secrets. Of course, that's the most bare bones summary that I can think of. It gets much deeper than that, with varying factions, side stories, and other lore. Snowbreak is developed by Amazing Seasun Games, a Chinese company that was responsible for their previous gacha game called, uh, Girl Cafe Gun. Snowbreak is their next ambitious project, and it launched globally on July 20th, 2023 on mobile and PC. In Snowbreak, you form a team of three operatives and go through a stage equipped with a variety of weapons and skills. You'll likely see a lot of similarities with Genshin Impact, as each operative has a gun that can be reloaded, a skill, and an ultimate skill. What's different though is that they also have a third ability called the Support Skill, where it can only be used when that operative is not on the field. So, if you're fielding your main DPS, you will press a separate button to activate your other two operative support abilities. Each operative has a blue gauge on top of their health bar called the S Energy Gauge, or Skill Energy, where it's tracked independently of each ally and used to activate and use that respective unit's skill. So, for example, you can't use both their normal skill and their support skill on the same rotation as you will run out of S Energy and you have to wait for it to refill. There is also U Energy, or Alt Energy, where it is shared among everyone, and you guessed it, it allows an operative to use their Alt. You can gain S and U energy by shooting and defeating enemies as normal means. Something else is that there's also a shortcut key, where you can activate a unit's alt, then immediately switch to that character in case you want a seamless transition. Just like most gacha games, there is an element system. There is a cover mechanic that sometimes works, a dodge roll, and ways to get creative with team building. Now unlike Genshin, Snowbreak is not an open world game. You navigate through a menu to access the mode you want, then dive into a level. This can either be the main story, a menu to farm materials, a co-op mode, a roguelike dungeon crawler, and some other ones we'll go over later. I know the gameplay can look like it can be summarized with Genshin but with guns, but it's far from that. So for each of the points I will cover in this review, I'm going to rate each on three different tiers. It's either below, within, or above expectations. Just know that I play as a low spender, so there will be certain limitations in place. Let's go over progression first. With the time replenishable resource called Presence, you can use it to run through different stages to farm materials needed to develop your operatives. My first hiccup when I started playing is that I got these little purple syringes that gave 30 points of something. I didn't know at the time that these green rock things actually represented presence points, since if you click on the bar that displays your current presence level, it shows a different icon. I didn't know that the two referred to the same thing, so I ended up wasting some of my syringes when I didn't need them. Anyways, if you run out of presence, there's a few modes that you can still do. But for the most part, the game will time gate you in progression until you come back for the next day, when presence is refilled. Even after a month of playing, I still don't have a fully equipped team, as I will have to wait until the next restock, as per usual with most gacha games. So the game will obviously not let you farm everything at once. Every operative is split into 4 and 5 stars, and can be leveled to a max of 80. What's interesting is that there's no ascension materials that you have to farm for, so it's a straight shot until level 80. But there is an ascension mechanic for weapons which are also split into 3, 4, and 5 stars. 
Technically, there are two star weapons, but that's the default one that the new operative comes with. Weapons can also be leveled to 80. You can also equip weapons with parts, which are earned through just progressing the game, from events, or reaching milestones that provide a small boost. You can also pull additional copies of weapons and units to limit break and further increase their power. Each operative can also be equipped with three logistics units, which are literally just artifacts from Genshin. If you equip two or three from the same squad, you will get a further boost. Logistics officers go up to 5 stars in rarity, and can be farmed via one of the modes. Something I noticed is that unlike Genshin, the standard pool logistics are all farmed at the same level. There are 8 squads or 24 total officers that can be obtained, and for every 40 presents spent, you only get one, randomly selected out of the 24. There is a semi-pity system where you can choose an officer to obtain from a select squad, but even then, it's also selected from one of its 3 members at random. This means not only do you have to get the specific officer you want, they also need to have favorable stat lines for the unit that you want to assign them on. Now, I'm gonna say it, I'm not really a fan of this system. Never like farming artifacts in Genshin, and in a non-open world game where your units are used less, it just feels pretty grindy to fish for the perfect builds for a second time. Now, there is an item that allows you to reroll the third substat on a logistics officer when they reach the highest level of 15. So I guess you can kind of control the rules that way. But if you already dealt with Genshin, I'm sure a lot of players just don't want to deal with this system for another game. Manifestations are further upgrades to a unit's power. Basically limit breaks or constellations from Genshin. They can be unlocked with tokens corresponding to that operative, and pulling additional copies will reward you with them. Though there is a trick to getting these tokens that we'll talk about later. Finally, you can upgrade a unit's two skills or alt by leveling something called Neuronics. You get these cells by, again, farming for it in the respective level. If you max out two of the trees, you will unlock an additional perk called the Daywolf's Alignment that further still boosts that unit. You don't need to max out every tree for every unit. If you're only using someone for their support ability, then just maxing that out is enough. So that's the five things needed to upgrade an operative. Yes, it's quite a lot. However, something I notice is that the majority of content in the game can be cleared without too much investment. During most main campaign stages, they literally give you trial operatives, so you don't even need a full team. Again, it copies Genshin's method of character progression with some small twists here and there. The gameplay does get pretty deep later on, as rotations and skill priorities do exist, though from the one month I spent casually playing, you won't see too much skillful maneuvers from the footage. There's quite a lot of mechanical executions on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. With the dodge roll mechanic, it can actually get pretty skill-based at times. Now look, I've never really been good at these shooter games. I got 800 hours in Deep Rock Galactic, and I've been playing some Helldivers 2 on the side. But I was never good at competitive play, though Snowbreak in this case was casual enough that even I can enjoy it. I never had any problems with Genshin's character progression, except in Snowbreak, you're not going to be using your units as frequently as there's no huge open world to explore. But hey, I can still slate progression in the Within Expectations tier. Let's go over the gacha rates and monetization. And oof, I have quite a lot to go over here. Again, just like Genshin, there are 4 and 5 star operatives. 8% flat chance for an SR, 0.7% for an SSR. Every 10 pulls will guarantee a 4 star, and the SSR pity is at 80. Though I've heard some people saying that there is a soft pity at the 60 to 70s mark. There is a 50% chance of an SSR being the rate up, and if you lose the coin flip, the next one is guaranteed to be the rate up. Both the pity counter and the second rate up guarantee are maintained across banners. Yes, this is basically a carbon copy of Genshin's rates, but slightly better. There is also a weapon banner, and I already hear some of you groaning in the background, because I can tell you this right now, the fact that it has a weapon banner is already an instant turnoff for some players. The majority of players are casuals. They want to save up for their favorites or meta characters and just be done with it. It just feels less fulfilling when you realize that in order for that character to perform at their best, you have to deal with the gacha system for a second time. I'm willing to bet that very few people pull on weapon gacha banners just because they like the look or the gameplay of it, but because it's out of necessity to make a character for as strong as they can be. Now, you can just argue this by saying, well, you don't need to pull gacha weapons, you can easily clear the majority of content without it. And yes, that is true. The point I wanted to make is that the gacha system is not something players have control over. Unlike things such as upgrading weapons and skills, if RNG doesn't favor you, it just feels especially bad when you spent your savings for a system that feels like it didn't need to be there. 
From what I've seen, I have not gotten a single 5-star weapon for the first month of playing, except for the one they gave for free. But I've also heard stories that certain characters will only excel if you get their signature weapon. So what the hell, let's take a look at the rates anyways. 5-star weapons also have a 0.7% drop chance, with a pity at 60 pulls, and 4 stars again at 8%, with 1 guaranteed every multi. The second rate-up guarantee is also present here, so it's not as bad as Genshin's epitomized path, but will still sink into your savings should you decide to go for the weapon. Something I noticed is that the character banner can only drop 4-star characters, while the weapon banner only dropping weapons. I think this is a pretty big mishap. Missing a rate-up 4-star in Genshin has the chance to spook you with a weapon instead, which I actually like. Here though, you can only get 4-star weapons by pulling on the weapon banner, so that leaves a bit of a sour taste. Going into the cow shop, you have your usual packages of whale bait, and something they do is putting a free daily package for a capsule that can gain you 30 presence points. This is a common psychological trick in games to expose you to the cash shop every day to incentivize spending. I can't say this is bad since Nikkei does the exact same thing, and you can easily argue this by saying, well, at least it's better than getting nothing. Every character or weapon voucher will cost you 160 digi cash, which is this purple crystal thing. You can get more by spending money on another currency called bid gold, which can be converted to digi cash. Literally just Genesis crystals from Genshin. But unlike Genshin, Bitgold converts to that purple crystal at a 1 to 10 ratio instead of Genshin's 1 to 1. What's more, every other purchase such as skins and battle pass all cost Bitgold instead of just listing the price in dollars. So you have to do some mental gymnastics to figure out how much they actually cost. The Welkin, or the 30 day supply pack, costs 30 Bitgold, which exactly translates to $5. But here's where it gets tricky. Let's take a look at the battle pass now. For the most part, I found completing one season to be fairly straightforward, and the tasks can be done pretty easily and don't take too long, so I don't have any problems with the time to completion. But the rewards you get though, I'm gonna have to talk about that. The premium track of the battle pass costs 68 bit gold, but there's no package for that exact amount. You can either purchase the $5 pack twice, then the $1 pack twice to get 72, with 4 left over for a total of $12, or buy the $15 pack once with 30 left over. The battle pass is not an even purchase, no matter which way you go about it. You will have some big goal left over at the end. But here's where it gets even more confusing. You'll see that there is a character skin that's associated with the premium battle pass, as usual with most gacha games. But the issue is, if you look at the premium's reward track, you're not going to see the skin. So the question is, how do I get the skin? Well, that's because you have to buy the second tier of the premium battle pass for a total of 128 bit gold. It's time to head back to math class, but luckily for you, if you buy the $15 pack and the $5 pack once each, you will end up with exactly 128. Wow, it's almost as if the second tier is an even purchase while the normal premium tier isn't then we might as well get this tier instead, because it's more efficient. Anyways, if you shell out $20, you get the skin right away, advance 10 levels in the battle pass, and gain some additional goodies after that. Instead of most games where the battle pass comes with a skin, this one feels like it's a skin that comes with a battle pass. Let's also focus on the tier 1 premium track again. you also see that you get a 4-star weapon selector, and some goodies. But this is actually not entirely what it seems. See, if you look in the premium track again, the 4-star selector is not present, meaning you will get it right away as you purchase the BP. But the other three rewards are present in the reward track, meaning these are obtained by earning them. If you look closely at the wording, it says, Activate to obtain Resonance Weapon Bay and new rewards for reaching past levels, meaning you will get the selector right away as it's not part of the track, but the other three items are earned as you go through the pass itself. Why it's labeled this way, I have no idea, it just causes some confusion, and for transactions involving real money, it's very important that the customer knows exactly what their money is getting them. Now look, I consider Genshin's gacha system to be the standard for this genre of games, so despite all the hiccups, I'll still give Snowbreak the within expectations rating for gacha and monetization. I have no problems if a game decides to copy some elements from Genshin, in this case the gacha and progression, the only thing is that if you're going to do that, then I also expect you to copy other qualities of Genshin, like story, world building, events, soundtrack, update frequency, and so on. Now, do those elements hold up in Snowbreak? Let's find out. 
The story of Snowbreak is bizarrely presented in a 2D visual novel style, while the gameplay itself is 3D. I'm not sure if it's a budget thing or a time constraint, but I found it to be a bit odd to be switching between the two styles. The story is also not voice, though I understand that this is a small studio, so I don't really mind there. One common complaint is that the story does start out pretty slow, and only start to ramp up at chapter 9 and onwards. I definitely felt the same, and even the level design, I overall found it to be a bit bland. You basically traverse through a linear map. For the first 9 or so chapters, you're gonna start to see the exact same Bleach City over and over, with some underground stages. There are some cool boss fights, but those are far and in between. Though the gameplay does start to do some reinventing in the later chapters, where in the last update, there was a section requiring some clunky stealth mechanics. I think in a genre where so much competition exists, you really want a strong hook or punchline to start off each player's experience. I think Nikkei definitely has it down, but here, not so much. The UI work, sound designs, and OST are just fine. It's not noticeably good, but I overall didn't have a problem with it. The characters do look pretty diverse, and I was surprised how few of them there are in the roster. Most 5 stars are just altered versions of their 4 star counterparts. There's also a lack of voice lines, so you'll hear the same skill and level complete lines over and over again. At the game's launch, most characters had modestly dressed clothing. The game wasn't really appealing to those that wanted fan service, and that's totally fine. Some players actually dislike gacha games that rely too much on sex appeal. It just depends who the game is marketing to. However, that changed when the studio wasn't doing too well in late 2023, and when they discontinued English voiceovers, that spelled trouble. People were speculating on a potential end of service. Well, in response, CSUN Games had the brilliant thought, what if we added more booba to the game? And so they launched their counterplay. In November of 2023, the first of the summer skin would start appearing. And when I see something like this, I'm thinking, the studio is getting desperate. Every gacha gamer knows that swimsuits are the ultimate cheat code to profit. The fact that they release it during winter hints that they're not doing too well financially. But to everyone's surprise, it sold relatively well. And in a power move in early 2024, Snowbreak was available on Steam no less. Revenue increased by 70%. As it turns out, trying to play a mechanically demanding shooter with flimsy phones didn't compare to a big screen with keyboard and mouse. The booba play was very effective. You can see their shift into more fanservice content in the recent patches. I mean, they literally advertised Katya, one of their latest waifus with an ASMR video. You can, of course, get some of the spiciest skins in the game right now, but if you wanted the premium ones with custom voice lines and live 2D animation, I'm afraid you're gonna have to shell out some dollars. There's also a separate mode where you can assign your operatives to their own room and decorate it with furniture to increase their bond levels. There's a Tetris minigame thing that allows you to earn currency needed for furniture and ways to trigger bond events every day. Surprisingly, the events physically take place in the 3D environment, unlike other story content. Some of the furniture even allows a special animation to play. Like this one, where... Okay, well, we gotta get that. Oh yeah. That's good. The game is currently at a point where it's attracting a larger fan base with its focus shifting on fan service. Whether or not you think this is a good thing, that's up to you to decide. The game is stabilizing itself, and I can definitely see it reaching first anniversary in July this year. Presentation is also within expectations for me, I think there's a bit of something here for whatever reason you're playing the game for, despite its odd choice of having 2D visual novel story cutscenes and lack of voice lines. Here's a sentiment you might be wondering. I am years late to the game's launch, I've missed out on all the cool events and characters, if I jump in now, can I still catch up and experience content from the past? This is what I plan on explaining with this section on FOMO elements. If a game relies too much on limited time content and rewards, it will deter new players from joining, as they feel that it's hopeless to catch up. How does Snowbreak handle FOMO elements? While the game has been out for just over half a year, the current version is 1.5, and each update has had an event that spanned across its runtime. Each event has its own story, and other than the sudden summer event in November, the other events have all just had main story chapters added. Of course, while the majority of the chapters are now permanent, you obviously will not be able to get the rewards, side game modes, and event items that have already disappeared. I normally wouldn't have made this section, as Snowbreak hasn't reached first anniversary yet, so a lot can change. But there was something that just really frustrated me that I wanted to talk about. 
so I managed to luck sack Katia in the last patch. She is the first to use the crossbow weapon in the game, meaning aside from the signature and the free event 4 star, you didn't have any other options. Okay, that's fine. I'll just farm for the event weapon and go with that. Now, something with these lesser known games is that it's really hard to find reliable info on how to build a character correctly. I found some helpful tips on the subreddit, and since I was brand new, I didn't know too much about the game, so I just followed the advice. Everything was fine. Until I got to the logistics section. See, since there's so many squads available, which one is the best for Katia? The guide mentioned something called the Eli squad, so I looked into it. I checked the logistics squad pool, and nothing resembled that. I checked another shop menu where there's some more logistics squads there, but nothing for Eli. So I thought, is Eli like a nickname or something? Is it like an abbreviation? Now at the time, I just kind of didn't bother with it and thought, I'll just do this some other time. So a couple weeks later, now the next patch is out. And I think to myself, oh yeah, I still have to build Katia. So how do you get the Eli squad? And it was at that moment that I realized a horrifying truth. Every event has its own shop, and there's actually two different tabs, a limited and an unlimited shop. See, in that other tab, every event also has an exclusive logistics squad that can be traded for with event currency. Usually, it is the best in slot for the current featured character. Since it is now the next patch, the Eli squad is now permanently unavailable. Why would you do that? Why would you do any of that? This is one of the biggest blunders I think the game has made. Unlike weapons, you still have to get the right substance for a good build, meaning farming for it is a long-term investment that is largely dependent on RNG. As it currently stands, there is no way to get event logistics from the past, meaning I am stuck farming for an inferior set of logistics in the permanent pool. Of course, fans are going to argue that the game will find some way to add a feature to obtain past event logistics, but I can't predict the future. I will review the game in front of me right now. And this decision to lock a farmable aspect of character builds behind a time-limited event is not something I can get behind. I can see this having some negative consequences as the game's roster expands. What's to stop the character that releases in the next patch to run into the issue of people wondering, hey, wait a minute, that event logistics three patches ago is actually their best in slot, except no one can farm it. For this reason, I'm gonna have to put Snowbreak in the below expectations tier when it comes to handling FOMO elements. Moving on, we have late game content. So what happens when the honeymoon phase of new players start to wear off and the game stops being so generous with rewards? How does Snowbreak handle and reward long-term players? Well, one of its shining aspects is that your dailies can take as little as three minutes to do. No, really, it has the shortest daily routine I've seen in a gacha game at the moment. There's some weeklies you have to do as well, and those can take like up to an hour, but in terms of respecting the player's time, Snowbreak's got it down. You can auto-battle levels that you've already beat, and with the story, if you click on the skip button, it literally shows you a synopsis of what happened. If we also take a look at the rates in which time resource is replenished, we can see that one unit of presence is refilled every 6 minutes. Since the cap is 240, let's multiply that by 6 to see how many minutes in total for a full recharge, and then divide that by 60 to get the total amount of hours. And we get… exactly 24. This means if you time it well, you just have to log in once a day to maximize your account. Very good. This is what I like to see. Something else I want to give the game credit for is its ability to reward your dedication to one character. Remember that each operative has manifestation levels that increase their power? Well, in a typical gacha game, you will have to pull multiple copies of that unit. But in one of the game modes called Personal Files, you can farm for an operative's extract. You get four a day, two for two different characters. With these extracts, if you have enough, you can actually upgrade their manifestation level. Rolling more copies in the gacha will obviously give you a lot more, and unlocking even the first manifestation with free extracts will take like a month, with the later ones costing even more. But the fact that this is possible is quite generous. Yes, it will take it free to play like 5 months to a year to max one out, but it is possible. In terms of challenge content, there is also the underground purge mode. It's basically Genshin's Spiral Abyss system. It rotates every couple weeks, and you have to build two separate teams to handle their respective side. Completing the objectives will reward you with even more currency. I'm not nearly qualified to do the later levels, and team building does matter more, and it does get pretty skill-based when fighting some of the encounters. 
There's also the Neural Simulation Boss Mode, where the bosses are chosen every couple weeks again, and it goes up to 5 difficulty levels. This is also where the competitive element comes in, as your overall rewards are dependent on how well you perform relative to other players, with the best rewards given to the top percentage of participants. Again, I can't hope to compete in this just yet, but from what I hear, Difficulty 5 does require some invested teams and can get pretty challenging. I will cover the remainder of the game's modes in the next section. But in terms of the daily grind and challenge content, Snowbreak's got a pretty good mix. It's short enough to be added as a side game, with some additional rewards if you put enough investments and are skilled enough. Because of the way the game respects your time and playstyle, this section gets an above expectation rating from me. Lastly, we will cover variety and content frequency. In the game modes menu, there is also a co-op mode where running through the level will grant points that can be used to gain even more resources. While you can do it alone, combining with two other players will generally make this mode a breeze. Though a common complaint is that each run just takes way too long. There's also the roguelike mode Paradox Labyrinth, where you go through a dungeon while selecting buffs to help you out. This mode is permanent and can also provide a steady supply of materials. Though unless you're okay with running through the same looking dungeon over and over again, you generally want to only do this once in a while. Every event also has its own game modes and side activities, though from what I've seen, the past events haven't been too innovative when it came to variety. There was a survival mode where you had to defend and survive against waves of enemies, in the exact same mode but in co-op. In the current event, there is also a co-op mode where you have to play tower defense and stop the enemy from advancing to your base. If the footage you've seen looks very similar, that's because, in my honest opinion, it kinda is. All the game modes are basically, shoot the enemies, get rewards. Some of it obviously reinventing itself slightly, but it's mostly just the same. In something like Genshin, there's quite a lot of side minigames that deviate from the normal gameplay loop, so that it's nice to take a break from what you're normally used to. Again, I wouldn't have raised this issue for Snowbreak. But the thing is, if you copy Genshin's gacha and progression, then I also expect you to copy other elements of Genshin, such as variety, side activities, and what we're about to cover next, content frequency. Genshin has kind of set the norm for a major update releasing every 6 weeks. Snowbreak, however, every 7 weeks, or 49 days. Considering that story content is not voiced and the side activities are more or less the same, while it does respect your time and make your dailies very short, there's not too much meat to the content. For these reasons, I'm putting variety and content frequency in the below expectations tier. Since its monetization model is the same as Genshin, I don't see why it's just a better choice to spend the same amount of money into that instead, and get more volume and more frequent updates. In this last section, I'm going to give my final rating, as well as answering a very subjective but personal question. Am I in or am I out? Do I see myself playing this game for the foreseeable future, or do I call it quits here and now? Snowbreak is a game that tries to copy Genshin's success through its monetization and progression system. Except it forgets to copy almost everything else that makes Genshin so enjoyable for many. The style and tone of the game is dreary and washed out, and while this would have made for a good artistic choice in a single player experience, it gets kinda old staring at the same monochrome UI and level structures. Its shooter gameplay loop, while enjoyable for those that like the genre, can get a bit dull and repetitive for casual players. Genshin has the ability to create completely different locales for you to explore, but you don't see the same in Snowbreak. At least not until the much later chapters. You can play it as a quick side game to farm your materials an inch closer to your ideal character build, but you do have to deal with the daily grind and questionable logistics system. Co-op mode and event content can shake up your gameplay loop, but not enough to completely reinvent how you play. Coupled with slow update cycles, and you're looking at a routine of doing your dailies, running through linear levels in co-op or dungeons weekly, and waiting close to 2 months for new content. I think Snowbreak has a lot of potential. No one has really done a third-person shooter gacha before. The character models, animations, and graphics look pretty good for a mobile game. If the devs use the revenue from their premium gacha skins wisely, play their cards right, and do some marketing here and there, increase the production on events, and I can see the game having a comeback in popularity. Overall, this game gets a decent 7 out of 10 from me. There's nothing glaringly wrong with it, it's definitely got its highs and lows. I think the game will be enjoyed by a small but dedicated community for now. I can see it making past first anniversary this July, though assuming if the developers don't keep up this momentum, I can't see the game continuing for more than a couple years. Over the past month, I've also gotten a good glimpse on the way the gameplay cycle goes. 
And from someone that typically doesn't do looter shooter games, Snowbreak would have to scratch a specific niche for you to keep you as a player. And unfortunately, that niche is just not for me. And for that reason, I'm out. Thank you for tuning in to the first volume of the Atrocious Scotch Reviews. I would like to know if you've also played Snowbreak or have some opinions on it, or if there's a gacha game you would like to see covered next. This video has been in the works for the past month, and I'm happy that it's finally done. So be sure to drop a like if you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching, and as always, have fun with the game.